This is House Planning Help, episode 120. Hi there, I'm Ben Adam Smith, and this is my podcast all about self build. I'm exploring what houses we should be building in the 21st century and trying to break down the major roadblocks that may get in our way. And alongside this is my own project, which I'm trying to get going. It's a bit of a struggle, wanted to get it done before I turn 40 this coming August. Today, my guest is Thomas Honor from Build Store. I'm calling this episode, What is a Self-Build Mortgage? So if you're someone who perhaps hasn't addressed your finances, you love all the design part of building your own house and thinking what you could have, this really is something that we should all do very early on. And it's the first time that I've been looking at it. <laughs> so it says it all really, doesn't it? First, though, a quick thank you. Well, two thank yous, actually. We've just held the meetup at EcoBuild. I think it's my fourth EcoBuild. I can't believe how the years are going by. And there were about 10 of us there. Thank you to everyone who came along, including Nick, who was a hub member. And I think one of the great things about this meetup was that we just took a few house plans and ended up talking through. And one of the main ones was, of course, Alex Baines's project that we feature in the hub. Alex also brought his architect, Alan, along. So that was really nice to get the input of both of them to see their working relationship. I quite enjoyed that. And it was just really good. We're going to be doing more of these in the future as and when. And that leads me to my final thank you, which is to the Passive House Trust, because we gate crashed their area there. And pretty much um, Kirsten had, to, <laughs> I don't know where she headed off to, but she had to leave so that we could squeeze in at the back there. So thank you very much. You guys are always great and uh, appreciate that. And as I say, when we have another event, houseplanninghelp.com slash events is where you'll find out about it. So it's interview time and this could be a part two, really. We could be saying this because we're back to the National Self-Build and Renovation Centre. However, talking money today. And frequently I hear this from people that they're going down there and they say, well, I just want to check on my finances or I'm going to see how much I can borrow. And it made sense that these are mortgage brokers who know what they're talking about. They seem plenty of self-builders. There are some differences between this and a traditional mortgage. So we're just going to get stuck in. Thomas Honor from Build Store is my guest. And first of all, I asked him to tell me a little bit more about what he does. Yeah. So my name is Tom. I work for Build Store Mortgage Services. Uh, I'm one of the mortgage advisors there. We uh, arrange all sorts of finance, arranging from new build homes, remortgages, buy to lets, purchases, uh, but we specialise in finance for projects. So self build, custom build, renovations, conversions. So my day job is to speak to people about how we can finance their projects. I am in this position at the moment that it feels like my budget can float a bit until I found that plot of land and got more detailed idea of what I'm building. So where do we start with knowing what we should access in terms of finances? Yeah, it, there's always this conundrum with self-build finance in the fact that you don't know how much you need to borrow until you found the plot uh, or what you're going to build on the plot. Um, but you don't know what plot you can buy or what you can build until you know how much you can borrow. So there is a bit of toing and froing. But we'd recommend that you come and speak to a, a, an expert within South Build Finance to ascertain your borrowing capacity and budgets that are available to you. We will look at things like your income and outgoings and be able to give you a, a rough idea on, on the amount you could borrow. So you know that you're looking for plots and builds that, that are going to be plausible for you. Let's go through an example then. Let's say I'm on the average salary in the UK, which I think was roughly around about £25,000 a year. I've saved up £100,000 for my build and I want to know how much more am I going to be able to borrow? Is sensible to borrow? Does that give you enough detail? What else would you like to know about me? Yeah, so uh, salary is the single most important thing because that's going to drive the amount of money that you, that you can borrow. And there are other things that we need to put into the equation, things such as your outgoings. So uh, have you got any ongoing credit commitments, things like credit cards, bank loans, car finance, uh, and other things as well, such as childcare costs uh, or any other significant outgoings. They'll be deducted along the way. Uh, and then generally speaking, most lenders apply an income multiplier uh, of somewhere between 4 and 4.25 times your, your, your joint household income. Each lender is obviously very different. Some are a bit more generous than others. Uh, and some uh, treat income and outgoings in different ways. So some might make, for example, if you're, you're someone that's uh, in receipt of bonus or overtime or uh, non-guaranteed allowances, some lenders are willing to consider all of that. Other lenders may only take a percentage of it uh, towards your affordability. Can I ask the fundamental differences between a self-build mortgage and a normal mortgage? 
Yep. So the main differences between self-built mortgages and a conventional mortgage are the way in which the, the funds are released. So on a conventional mortgage, if you're purchasing a, a second-hand property or a new build property, you'll get all of the money in, in one lump sum. Uh, along with your deposit, you use that to purchase the property. Uh, with self-build mortgages, the money's released in stages. Uh, there's two phases. The first phase is uh, money released to help you purchase the plot. And the second is to help you fund the build of that. Uh, typically, you'd be looking at uh, four to five stage release payments, um, which are released as, as the build progresses. When we talk about stage payments, are there ever any difficulties because you get your money at a certain point and I'm sure it doesn't always work that that's the exact right amount of money or is there a way of approaching this? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, there are the two different types of self-build products. The first one is a traditional self-build product which provides the money in arrears of the stage being completed. So this is particularly useful for people that have got large larger deposits or may own the land outright. Um, because it keeps their cash flow positive. And basically it means that the, the, the client puts in their own money up front uh, and the lender gives the money in arrears once the work's been completed. It can cause some cash flow difficulties, particularly with more modern types of construction, things like timber frame, structurally insulated panels and insulated concrete forms, because quite often the manufacturer will want a larger chunk of money earlier on in the project. So the cost is borne quite early on. Um, so the, the second type of product, which was designed by Build Store to mitigate these cash flow difficulties, is the accelerator product, which gives the money in advance of each stage. So this gives the client the money upfront, payable to, to the builder before the works are completed to ensure that cash flow remains positive throughout and that there's no negativity throughout the whole project and then it can run smoothly. What happens if our financial circumstances change? Do we still have access to this agreed amount? So once the application's been fully underwritten, um, you'll, you'll be in receipt of a mortgage offer. And once that's signed and agreed, essentially that's the lender committing to giving you the funds. Leading up to that point, as part of the underwriting checks, we as your broker and the lender have got a duty of care to ensure that that mortgage is going to be affordable for you. So if we're aware of any pending changes, then yeah, that might influence the, the lender's willingness to give you the money. Uh, and that's really just to protect the client from not uh, over borrowing or overstretching themselves. When you see people come in and ask you questions, are they generally surprised about the, the amounts that they, they can and, and can't borrow in terms of you know, getting to the actual build? Um, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Obviously, some some people have been through. You might have had. Uh, we, we go. We would speak to people that are first time buyers, right through to people that may have mortgaged three or four times previously. So it just depends on how afraid they are with the process. On the whole, I mean, there are lenders that will lend similar amounts to lenders that lend more conventional mortgages. On the whole, that, that again, there are a number of lenders that might not lend quite as much as those conventional mortgages. So we do get a bit, a bit, uh, a mixed bag. Uh, but that's why it's important to establish your budget so early on to know exactly what your borrowing capacity is, so that you're not got your heart set on a particular plot or a particular build to find out, you know, when you're quite heavily committed on that, that actually you can't afford it. In the introduction, you were saying that um, you also do remortgages. So is that when you're on a build and perhaps you've got to a stage where the money has got tighter again? And what are your options then? Yeah. So again, as your mortgage broker and the lender, both of us work together to ensure that your bill costs are reasonable and they're going to be plausible for the type of project that, that you're doing. So we're going to not, not necessarily lend you a £100,000 if you're planning on building a 10-bedroom mansion. We, we do police those quite closely to make sure that your budget is realistic. You can build what you say you're going to build to prevent the need for anyone to come back and have to borrow money mid-project. Because if you do that, you do need to reapply. Your application will need to be reassessed. And there's no guarantee that you'll get any further funds. Most importantly, it's likely to incur you delays. And those delays inevitably will be quite expensive for you. So we do a lot of work up front to make sure that the amount you borrow up front is going to be enough, including things such as contingencies and other costs that you may not have looked at. Of course, there are times when uh, we do our best to make sure that doesn't happen. And there are some rare occasions where people do need to come back and borrow further funds. And that's uh, what we'd normally call a, a further advance or an additional advance where you can apply for further money subject to underwriting from the lender to make sure that bill can be completed. So it, it's not quite a remortgage. Uh, it's, a, it's an ad additional loan. 
What do we need to know about these mortgages in terms of setting it up? Or is it, is it again, you've got to go through each one individually? Yeah, it, it varies from lender to lender. Like with most mortgages, there will be costs to set up. Typically, you'd be looking at an arrangement fee, which most lenders will, will charge a standard on any type of mortgage these days. Also, a valuation fee. The valuation fee is a little bit different on a self build than it is to a conventional mortgage because they're not just going to value a, a house that's already built. Uh, on a self build uh, instance, they'll be valuing the plot based on its value now and, and what you're paying for it. They'll also give an end value based on what you're planning on building and what they think it'll be worth when it's completed and also a reinstatement value for site insurance purposes. So, so far you've got an arrangement fee and a valuation fee. Some lenders may charge other additional fees, things like booking fees. They're all quite similar, but they name them, name them differently. Our job as your broker is to make sure you're aware of all of those fees up front so that you know what they are, what they cover, what you're paying for them and when they're due. If we're someone who has, say, got a, a lot of investments or had money tied up, what can we do in terms of bridging the finance situation and perhaps how can we get ourselves better prepared? Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, there is options for people to use a bridging facility, which is is often uh, suitable for people that own an asset but may have a low income. You know, they've got a house worth, I don't know, uh, 500,000, but they might be on a pension income of just 10,000 and they want to borrow more than that 10,000 would allow them to do on a, on a typical mortgage. So what we can potentially look at is, is bridging that finance, securing that against their existing home. That enables them to build their house. They can then move into that house, sell the old one and use that money to pay off the bridging facility. What am I not thinking of in this conversation? You're the expert. What else do we need to be considering? One of the other uh, contributory factors is construction types. So not all lenders will lend on all different types of construction. All of them will end on your more traditional type, so masonry, sort of brick and block. But why? Um, why is that? It's it, a lot of it's due to a resaleability. So, being able to have, you know, if you've got quite a uh, a weird and wonderful construction type, it might not be to everyone else's taste. So the lender's always thinking about: Are they going to get their money back? And if they had to take possession of that property, how easy is that property going to be to sell? So if you've got a property that's quite an acquired taste. Um, the lender needs to take possession of that, they may struggle to get their money back. Whereas a more traditional looking building is is not going to have too many issues in being sold on again. Because obviously there's, there's so many in the market already. And typically, if the buyer of that needed to obtain their own mortgage, most lenders would lend on a masonry construction opposed to something that was, that was kind of non-standard. If we have got something that's unusual, what are our options? How can we make this a nice, easy run? The most important thing is that, that we can fund non-standard constructions, but non-standard means uh, different things to different lenders. So it's just important that we can place it with a lender and that can also lend you the amount that you want in the area of the country that you're building, on the type of plot that you're building on. Some lenders will deem timber frame non-standard. A lot of them will deem that standard. Other more modern types of construction, things like steel frames, insulated concrete forms, structurally insulated panels. The good news is that more and more lenders are deeming that traditional now and are happy to lend against those construction types. But again, not all lenders. So it's important that you check that with your mortgage broker to make sure that we can fund your, your project. A lot of us are wanting to build energy efficient homes, passive house homes, and I know there are certain mortgages that offer some benefits. So why is that? How do we get them? Is it exactly the same process? Yeah, um, there are lenders out there that will offer discounts for building um, energy uh, efficient homes. And there are other lenders that, that, that you know, it doesn't matter how energy efficient it is, it's the same product that's out there all the time. So it, it's just down to the lender's preference and their outlook on um, what type of mortgage book they're trying to keep. And they're few and far between. There, there are sort of one or two lenders that offer those discounts, but on the whole, it's more down to if the client wants it to be eco-friendly and, and, and energy efficient rather than um, because the lender wants you to do it. Let's go back a bit here and talk about those early stages of deposit. So let's say we come to you, we have our, our chat and we don't know when we're going to build our house. So 
How can we clarify this in our mind that maybe we need to go away and keep working on our deposit? How, how does this work? So uh, like with every mortgage, you will need to put down and contribute a deposit from your own own funds. So typically with most self bill mortgages, you can put down a minimum deposit of around about 10% of the overall project costs. Now that project cost is derived by the combined land cost and the bill costs. So, um, you know, if you've got a land costing you 100,000 and bill costs of 100,000, 10% of that, you know, 200,000 altogether, you'd need to put down 20,000 of your own savings to meet the minimum requirements for that. The more deposit you can put down, the more favorable interest rates that would be available to you and possibly more lenders. There are also options for people that already own the land to use that as their contribution as a deposit. So if they own the land outright already, say a garden plot that's worth, you know, 50,000 as an example, um, that would be their 50,000 pound contribution as a deposit. Do you find that many people actually are stopped in their tracks because of this deposit? Because you don't want to get into a nasty situation. You must have you must have seen a few. Yeah, I think with all, all types of mortgages, there are some people that aren't going to have the sufficient levels of deposit to buy the plot at that time. You know, there's, there's lots of people that, that will come to us and they found their dream plot and they know what they want to build on it. But at that moment in time, they've just not got the required deposit to put down. But, it, it, you know, it's it's important that, that we, we, we go through that process with a client because what we don't want there is them stretching themselves to put to just scrape together the deposit but then there might be other unexpected costs they, they hadn't considered things like stamp duty on the land uh, maybe architects costs for design of the property and insuring the site so site insurance and structural warranties are all costs they need to consider and that we would rather decline someone up front and say we can't help you than than put them in a position where they've got a, a project that can't complete because there's not enough money is there any advantage of almost having a gap, a pause between getting the land and moving on to the next stage? Because once you've started building, that's the risky bit again, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the lenders will underwrite the, the project up from day one. So um, they want to make sure that you've got enough deposit from day one, from when you're applying for the mortgage. They won't rely on, you know, sort of money coming in uh, to your bank account throughout the project. So they know that the, the moment they release their funds to help you buy the land, you can simultaneously, you know, start the project and, and complete the project um, without any cash flow difficulty. So that's protecting the client and the lender f- from any risk there. Most lenders will put in some sort of caveat to say that you must complete the build inside two years, which is quite a broad, you know, broad time scale. Most projects that we, you know, people that we speak with, are completing their projects within sort of six to twelve months. So it does allow the option to potentially, you know, take a bit longer to complete the build and even even have a, a small break in there if need be. What else do we need to think about when we're financing a self-build? It's important that the budgets are broken down in detail. So again, we've talked about deposit. Um, you need to have a, a minimum 10% deposit to put towards the, the build and, and land costs. But there are other costs that you're going to need to consider. I touched on site insurance, structural warranties, things like contingencies as well it's important that every person we speak with sets out with their best interest to go out and and bring the project in on budget and on time the reality is that doesn't always happen uh i'm sure we've kind of all seen the tv programs it makes great telly when someone runs over budget uh, but it's not so good if it happens happens to yourself so it's important there is a buffer in there for any unexpected or hidden costs should they arise they can be covered It, it doesn't bring the project to a halt is that effectively what you're doing, working very closely with a budget? If I come to you, you're not going to be interested in speaking to me unless we can put together a budget. Yeah, and, and the people that will be at different stages of their planning. So, you know, we have some people that are coming to us very early on. They haven't found land. They haven't. They don't know exactly what they want to build. They might have an idea on where they want to build and what sort of property. But at that early stage, we can help the client put our arm around them and say, look, this is the sort of budget that's plausible for you. These are the sorts of land costs you, you can be looking at and what you can build based on your budget so it gives them an idea on 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 what they can build they can go out to the market search for plots if they then find a plot that they like they can come back to us and we can put together more of a detailed budget specific to that project and that plot to make sure that it's, it's going to be plausible can you talk a little bit about the services that you provide and also we know uh, harvey we spoke to last time uh, told us about the store but we can also learn here too Yeah, so um, we are a a mortgage broker. We specialise in finance for projects, which is it's quite a complex niche market. 
there aren't as many lenders that lend for self build as there is for a conventional mortgage. And, and then the lending criteria is quite complex. So it's important that you do speak with an industry expert to make sure that we get the application right for you and the budget's right and we can get the money that you need. So we provide a fully advised service. Once we've assessed the client's need, we'll be able to make a recommendation on the best way to fund their project for them. We will also manage things like their stage release payments. So we're not just going to give them the mortgage and then send them off on their way. We hold their hand right through the process to make sure that not only does the builder get the money when they need it so the project can run smoothly, they get the right amount so the cash flow remains positive throughout the project as well. And the courses here, is that some of the things that they touch on? Yes, yeah, again, so there's obviously courses here at the National South Build Renovation Centre. We do a, a session on the course about finance where we give people a kind of a, a set a mini seminar on things they need to be considering at the early stages when financing. We touch on budgeting, we touch on cash flow, we touch on the products that are available and also some of the other costs, things like contingencies and insurances. By going with a, with a broker like us ourselves, you, you have got that reassurance and, and peace of mind that we're going to be with you every step of the way and we're not just going to leave you out there on your own. It's interesting that a lot of people that I speak to, they start their journey here. So it's clearly a good service that you're providing. Yeah, well, we, we, we build still, we've had a base here since the centre opened. We've got advisors based permanently here in Swindon that are happy to speak to people that are just uh, either early stages or are ready to pursue finance straight away. We also have coverage across the UK as well and other areas. So, you know, we've got people in, in most places across the UK to be able to speak to people locally. And finally, just looking at self-build in general, what do you think the biggest barriers are within finance? Uh, the the biggest barriers are probably things like affordability uh, at this moment in time. Since the mortgage market review, um, which happened by the regulator a couple of years ago now, there's more of a burden on, on lenders to ensure they're lending responsibly. So there are lots of rules and regulations in place to ensure that uh, they are doing that, which is which is right. They should be lending responsibly and, and, and we, we completely back that. But also some of their affordability criteria does limit the amount that people can borrow. And, you know, they might not quite be able to borrow the amounts that they want, which means they need to put more deposit down and, and things like that. Other things like construction types, again, it's important just to make sure early on that we can, we can lend against the construction types. The good news is we can lend against every construction. We do also have um, particular products that complement certain construction types. The more, more modern types of construction where the cost is borne earlier on in the project, things like timber frame, insulated concrete forms, structurally insulated panels. Um, the manufacturer quite often wants the money quite early, which can cause cash flow difficulties uh, for, for your project. So we have products, we've designed a specific product, the accelerator product, which provides money in advance up front to make sure the manufacturer can be paid and keeps the cash flow positive throughout the project. Well, Tom, thank you very much for this today. I hope I haven't been too rough around the edges. As you can see, finance is perhaps not a strength. I appreciate your time. No problem at all. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Head online to take a look at the show notes for this session. They're at houseplanninghelp.com slash 120, where you can review the main points. It's also a place for comments or questions. Just scroll down to the bottom for that. We'll link you across to Build Store in case you need to check out your financial situation. In fact, after the conversation that you've just heard, our interview, I had my private chat with him as well, looking into my own finances. And Thomas came up with a couple of angles that I hadn't even thought about. This is why I needed to have that chat. Houseplanninghelp.com slash 120. Let's wrap up the podcast today by telling you about The Hub, particularly if this is the first podcast in the House Planning Help series that you've listened to. What is it? Why have I created it? Well, really, there are a few reasons behind it. One of them is support. And I'm finding this that I think I'm very determined to build my own house and to make it happen at some point. I set myself this target, which I thought back in 2012 was totally realistic of completing my build by August of 2016. And I haven't even found a piece of land yet. So I think it is a long journey, even if you are far, far better than I am. So some of this is support and I'm getting that as well in the community side of the hub quite pleased as well that I'm learning from the others and being inspired by them. For example, Dean the other day was telling me about a couple of things that he has done to try and just unearth a plot. It's not the conventional route of going to right move or plot finder and looking for plots because they don't always come up. But 
he went and he put an advert in the local magazine. So it's things like this. And it's just inspiring to be with those sorts of people, people who are genuinely going to build a house. And some, for example, like Donald, he's already started. He's posted up some pictures of day one. We're getting really excited for him. So there's that side. There's the information side. Perhaps we know a lot from the podcast and some of the videos that we've had on YouTube. This is going a step further and really trying to refine it, to organize it, to add in extra parts, take out stuff that was irrelevant. Just make it very step by step and easy to understand. Um, We're adding modules all the time there. And then the other element is the video side of things, because that's what we do at Regen Media. We enjoy doing it. And I just see huge potential, particularly if you like learning by video. There's so much we can do here. And that brings me to another reason for doing it is that if I can get this model working, then I believe as a content creator and communicator, I can do so much more, not only in the hub, but also put out more free content there and perhaps help other people that I think could do a lot more. For example, just to throw a quick one in here, my mate Lloyd Alter at Tree Hugger, who I just, I really admire what he does. He's a great writer and he is having an impact. I really feel he is. Yet, I feel he could do more. They could do more at Tree Hugger. They could hold conferences. They could make documentaries and just spread that message even further. So I'd love to be able to support. And there were lots of people, I'm not just singling him out. I think there are lots of people that I come across just think you're so talented. If only we had the resources to do more. So that's my mission. If I save you time and money by making the hub actually work and refining things there, then hopefully you're paying for a resource that you're happy with that's then giving us more funds to create in other areas. That's the idea of it. It's a long term game. I know it's not going to happen overnight. Houseplanninghelp.com slash hub. If you've been sitting on the fence for a while, please sign up. We'd love to have you there. Right, that's me done. Next time, Janet Cottrell from Passive House Homes is my guest. We're going to be covering the pros and cons of building a passive house with a kit. I hope you can join me for that one. The House Planning Help podcast is produced by Regen Media, content that matters.